five. Welcome to Photos with Stories, our special Valentine's Day edition. Um, thank you all so much for joining us um, while you're having brunch with your sweetheart and hanging out. I'm super excited for today's program. We got my old friend, Michael Greco, who's just an incredible, brilliant photographer, has been shooting for many, many years. And um, uh, he has a great story. We'll get to that in a minute. First, my usual um, pre-show announcements. Again, I want to thank our video director, Will Schwerd, and uh, we've got Harrison Ezradi and uh, uh, Joe Lentini uh, getting your questions. So anywhere that you can put a question in on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching, put your questions in for Michael. And at the end of the program, he will answer your questions. So thanks to Joe and Harrison for doing that. We want to thank the staff for helping put all this together. We've got Healy and Steph May and Pete Shapiro and Corinne who help out with marketing and graphics and, and fans.live in general. So we want to thank all of them for giving us the bandwidth and uh, letting us tell our stories and um, bring interesting uh, uh, presentations, photos with stories. As you know, almost all of these are about photographers, but every once in a while we veer off and we find somebody who's got a great story and we have photos to support that. And so we did a guy named Bob Barsotti a few weeks ago. You can go find that on, on YouTube, Photos with Stories with Bob Barsotti. Bob worked with Bill Graham at Bill Graham Presents for decades and produced hundreds of Grateful Dead concerts and hundreds of stadium concerts and Loggins and Messina and Leon Russell and The Who and, and, and you know, the list goes on and on and on. And, you know, every artist imagine Bob Dylan, George Harrison, the Rolling Stones. And so we brought in Bob and he told his story. And that was uh, the first program we did of 2021. So go check that one out. Uh, coming up in two weeks. So we do this every other Sunday. Uh, coming up in two weeks on February 28th, we have a guy named Godless. Yes, that is his real name, David Godless. And Godless is a street photographer. And he's going to show us photographs that he took between 1974 and 1984 in the streets of New York City. He has a new book out called Streets. And, um, and, and that book is unbelievable. And David Godless's work is unbelievable. So join us in two weeks for Godless here on Photos with Stories. Uh, you'll start seeing stuff on the social media channels in about a week about that. Um, some of it might already be out there and it's probably listed on the fans.live website. Um, excuse me a second here. Michael Greco, my guest, has this new book out, which is just absolutely brilliant. Uh, punk, post-punk, new wave. Um, and it is, of course, the story of that scene starting in the 1970s. Coming up through the 80s, this is uh, Wendy O. Williams from the Plasmatics on the cover here. Uh, Fred Schneider from the B-52s wrote a great forward. Um, you can buy this book anywhere that you can buy books. And I highly recommend going out and checking this out because this is really just amazing photography. As we're going to see as we get into the program uh, with, uh, with Michael. Another program that I have coming up in the future, we don't have a date for it yet, is this guy, Danny Zalisco. Danny's a concert promoter in Arizona, has promoted over a thousand, I'm sorry, promoted thousands of concerts over the last 40 years working with people like Bill Graham. Uh, but in the Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and Las Vegas area, this is a great book. I just finished it. And we're going to have Danny on the program probably sometime in March or April. We're still trying to figure out the exact date. So keep your eyes out. That'll be another Photos with Stories. That's about the stories with photos to support it, not a photographer. So I'm going to try and bring something like that to you every few months if I can. Uh, not a photographer, but a great story. Um, working on some other really interesting people. Michael Greco. Michael Greco has been shooting since the 1970s. I uh, grew up in, in, in Westchester County, New York. Um, he picked up a camera at an early age. He worked in dark rooms in high school in the 1970s. He graduated high school in the mid 1970s. Um, and, uh, you know, some of his first music that he really loved were people like David Bowie and Roxy Music and the New York Dolls. But he was also a jazz guy. And so he kind of, you know, he, he really dug the improv um, uh, way of jazz music. And, and a lot of that informed his, his visual sense in terms of how he's improving 
when he's photographing artists. And so back in the old days in the, in the late seventies and the early eighties, when we were shooting in clubs and shooting bands that you were being crushed against the stage because it was a punk band. And I was shooting stuff like that in the late eighties, shooting Jane's addiction in small clubs or the butthole surfers and being crushed against the stage. Um, you have to improv, right? And it was really the beginning of a time where photography was shifting in some ways and the technology was shifting a little bit in terms of lighting. Uh, Michael is one of the very first photographers to actually bring strobe lights in and hang them in the lighting grids at a show to light the stage up. And it was just a brilliant idea. Sports photographers do that. High-end Sports Illustrated guys, they put big strobe lights up in the ceiling so those super frozen dunk, slam dunk photographs are beautifully frozen photographs as opposed to the newspaper guys shooting with the available light in the room. So Michael was really cutting edge early on in a lot of different ways and uh, really, really just a smart, um, intuitive, creative photographer from day one. Um, and, and, you know, and he looked at a lot of this early, we'll call it, you know, commercial commercial rock and roll, the journeys and the, the, the Kansas and sticks and bands like that, which were maybe manufactured or really just, you know, put out there by the record labels. And that's not the stuff he was interested in. He was interested in the gritty down and dirty uh, work that you were, that was going on in the, in the small, in the small clubs. So um, let's everybody welcome Michael Greco to the program photos with stories. Thanks Michael for being here. I'm so excited to show your work. How Thank you doing? You. I'm doing good. Thank you, Jay. Um, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. I really appreciate it. My wife, uh, my, my, we postponed our uh, morning brunch to be here. So um, I, I really thank everyone for, for making the effort. So, so Michael, talk, talk to me about like some of the early influences uh, on you as a photographer, um, not from the music side or the, the jazz world, but like as, as a photographer, was it people like Lee Friedlander or Bruce Davidson or, or Irving Penn or, 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 you know, because you've done incredible portrait work in your later career and some portrait work in your early career, but you've got this like street vibe and this grittiness to your early work. Who were your early ins inspirations? Well, I, I think the, the, how I started is a little bit of happenstance. So it was the, it was the situation, but I, so I, I learned darkroom <clears throat> in summer camp and then didn't understand what photographs should be right what what what's an interesting thing to put in the frame um and i would go to the greenberg public library which was behind my house and under my shirt i want you know once a day i would start with the time life series on photography uh which were actually much better books in the 70s i think they they were thicker and more impressive and more important and and they had great photography in it. And those books ran the gamut, man. They they ran, they had everyone in those books. They had Lee Freelander, they had Bruce Davidson, they had Penn, they had Hero, they had Avedon. Um, those books really ran the gamut of fine art photography, documentary photography, portrait photography. I was always drawn to the portrait photographers. I was always, you know, really impressed by Avedon and Hero and um, some of Bruce Davidson's portra portraits. I remember an environmental portrait of a mother and child on a bed in Harlem. Um, um, but I... I, you know, I had the experience of seeing all of it and understanding what was appreciated as great photography. But the reality is, is when I went to college, I got caught up in a photojournalism course and I thought it was just cool to see life that way, you know, to mm -hmm. see life that way with a camera. You know, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd wake up in the morning. I worked for the Associated Press. I started in 78. I'd wake up in the morning and was in the governor's office at the press conference. And he goes, hey, Mike. Hi, Mike. Mike Dukakis. Hi, Mike. You know, so it was just like a fascinating thing to do as a 19 year old. Yeah, absolutely. Um so we so summer camp taking pictures of counselors and campers, uh, working in the dark room, high school ca ca counselors, no campers. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the girl hot counselor. counselors, hot counselors, hot hot girl counselors. That's a book in itself, right? <laughs> hot girl, hot camp girl counselors. I like that. In in bikinis around the pool, you have to understand. Right in the nineteen seventies. Exactly. Um, awesome. Uh, Okay, so you leave Westchester, you go to college up in Boston, you go to Boston University, 
Um, what are you studying? Are you, do you have, they have a photography program there or they well, are, are journalism? Where, where are you at? In, in well, so I, uh, my, I, I was always a slow reader. So I, my grades weren't quite good enough to get right into the school of communications. And so I did, I, I entered into the college of liberal arts, which is your general studies. And within a, within the first semester of the second semester, my, uh, you know, my grades were sufficient to transfer. So uh, in 77, I transferred to the School of Public Communications and did I, I when I was in high school, I, I was my inspiration in photography was with a art teacher called Andrew Courtney. And it was all fine art photography. I would do these surrealist collages and I would shoot, you know, fine art portraits of friends. And I, I studied with uh, Curtis Taylor and Gail Russell in the 70s and Manhattanville College and uh, SUNY Purchase. And then I entered college and it was like, I was in the school of communications that it was not frilly willy photography. It was not fine art photography. The only real photography course was a photojournalism course. Um, I did a photojournalism course with Ken Cobry and um, the guy who wrote the book on photojournalism. And by the end of that first semester in 77, he had me interning for the Associated Press. And the internship was supposed to start like mid-January. And what wound up happening is there was the blizzard of 78. There was like a four or five feet snowstorm that they pushed the snow out of the way. And then when two days later, there was another four or five, six foot snowstorm, there was no place to put the snow. So it locked the city down and I'm a skier. So I put on all my ski stuff and ski clothes and mask. And, and I walked from Mass Ave and Marlboro Street to Summer Street in Boston, which is a fairly long way. And I walked in with three rolls of film on the blizzard. But, you know, I was on the highway shooting the signs with no cars on it. I, you know, and that that started my career. I never looked back. Where did you bring those photos to the AP or to the newspaper? The Associated Press. Because you were interning there. Um, and so and, I, I walked into my internship two weeks early and started two weeks early. Right. And did those photos, did they publish those photos? Yeah. I had two pictures on the wire that night. And did it turn you, did it, did it like turn you on? Did, like, did it just like elevate your, everything about your life at that moment? Like seeing your work in print like that on the AP wire out in, I mean, it was probably in 50 newspapers around the country, a hundred newspapers, 200 newspapers. I mean, did that kind of blow your mind a little bit that you're, oh, it, it, it was, I mean, it was amazing. And you real, you know, that's part of why you do it. it. It's like still to this day, if I do make a picture that I'm proud of, I still have that. Ah, moment. Yeah. I still have that. Like, oh, that's cool, man. You know, uh, did I do that? Really? You know, it's funny because uh, when we used to shoot film and I haven't shot film in 10 years and we'd go to the lab and get it developed and, you know, we shot transparencies or whatever. And we'd we'd look at them on the light table. And I just remember being so turned on, like and I was like, OK, I still like photography. This still turns me on. And when I shoot digital photos and I go back to my my studio and I download them into my computer and I look at them and I see what I and I love what I see. I'm like, I still get turned on by that, you know, so I know that I've still love photography and I, I I'm still passionate about it because it still turns me on when I make photographs that I really love. So, all right. So you're, so you're working for the AP um, and you're doing that starting in college. Are you starting to shoot punk bands and club shows while you're in well, college? Then in a very parallel sense, I, I was um, living at 700 tower, which I don't even think it exists anymore. It was like this very industrial cinder block, three towers they called it the zoo but that's where i was freshman year and it was right outside of kenmore square and i started wandering into the rat and i started wandering into the rat and i think the first night i was there this band this local boston band la peste was playing it was the boston battle of the bands and la peste was like this kind of dark punk band and the music was, you know, you talked about what turned me off on on radio, because really that's how we got people forget our, you know, our wonderful audience. You know, we didn't get our music from, uh, you know, from a computer, from YouTube, from uh, iTunes. We got our music from listening to the radio or either that or you walked into a record store and had someone you trust and they would tell you what to buy. And and but. You know, and the radio then 
to me, sucked behind. I mean, it was terrible. It was the Kansases and the hair bands and Alice Cooper and, you know, and music that didn't feel authentic to me. And then I walk into the rat and it's like, whoa. Right. Yeah. There's nothing like that feeling of being in a club, a small club with all that sweat and energy and, you know, stage diving and just the intensity of that. I mean, so many shows that I shot, you know, and people think of me as this Grateful Dead hippie photographer, but, you know, the late eighties, I shot so much of that, that type of music. And it was just so exhilarating to experience that. Let's jump into some of your photos here. So here in the beginning of this presentation, um, we've got pictures of you, uh, in your early days, mostly in things that you did when you were in college or working for the AP or the Boston Herald when you were still in, in, in L.A. So this first shot here is you um, holding somebody's hand. And I believe this is a no nukes protest at Seabrook. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And and, and so I, I always I took a year off from college. I was supposed to graduate in 80. I graduated in 81. Um, but I always went to school and shot and went out like I would do whatever classwork I needed to do. I'd shoot for the Associated Press, however I could fit it in between my school schedule. And I, at night, I'd be out in the club. So we, you so know- You're working we, 18, 18 hour days. What kind of drugs were you doing? A lot of uh, coke? cocaine? Cocaine, lots of cocaine. Right, it was the, it was the <laughs> late seventies. <laughs> lots of cocaine, and and you know, get, be, getting paid twenty five dollars on an Associated Press assignment. Um, I, you know, I was dealing a little bit of cocaine too at the time. So. Right. Um, All right. uh, well, your parents still love you, Michael, because you've turned out. Well. They didn't know. They didn't know. <laughs> I kept it. I kept it very, you know, sort of the book when it, I tell these stories in the book about my personal life. It's like it's the first time if my parents were alive, you know, it would be the first time if they read it, you know, to, to see. So, right. Well, you um, know, we all sold drugs when we were younger. And unfortunately, I got caught. And I, I don't know if you know this. I went to prison for nine months for for selling drugs when I was no, there. I had no idea. Yeah. Well, that's a whole nother story. We'll tell it another time, but anyway, <laughs> so, all right. So, so this next shot, this is also the Seabrook protest where these, the water cannons are going and, and these are protesters trying to like storm the gates. I mean, this is like this photo right here. And then all the people in the background and you can see these other photographers and, but you're like right there in that shot. Like you knew that you needed to be at a different angle. You know, uh, uh, everybody else is sort of in the safe zone. You look at, I see two photographers, at least three, four, five, six, seven. I see at least seven photographers in the background and they're all in the wrong spot and you're in the right spot, you know? And that's to me indicative of someone who knows how to get a photograph. Um, here you are, and that's you with your hand on your head. This is an anti clan protester. You're covering it. And, and, and the police decide they're going to beat up the press. And so you got hit with this billy club in the head, right? Yeah, I had a gray spot. Now I have a gray spot all over, but I had a gray spot of hair there for years where I got hit in the head. I, I was working for the Associated Press at the time. That picture actually made the cover or the page one of the Boston Globe. Um, and the Associated Press didn't do shit to, like, take care of me or file a complaint against the police. They were too afraid to say anything. So I was very disappointed in the way they tr treated their their people. So. Right. And then here you are in an event with Elizabeth Taylor on assignment, probably for the Boston Herald here, I guess. or the AP. Well, the interesting thing is I joined Picture Group in 1980 also. So Which is like a celebrity distribution network for picture photos. group was a mostly documentary. Marcel Saba was my first yeah. editor and his wife, Jean. So they were um, they were very photojournalistic newsish kind of thing. But I would feed them my I would pick up assignments. So in 1980, I was shooting the president of Polaroid um, who gave me the first SX-70 camera. Um, and at the same time. Um, um, you know, I was, I, I was working Sending those photos for, to Saba for syndication. Yeah. And, uh, so some of the music stuff went there. I was picking, so I was picking up magazine assignments and then some of the, um, I wouldn't mix the associated press stuff with the, with the magazine stuff because, you know, you were on assignment for the associated press, but I would pick up assignments for picture group. Um, the John Glenn campaign, some of the political campaigns, Jesse Jackson, uh, Business Week portraits of, uh, like I said, the CEO. Uh, but then some of the music, the CEO of Polaroid, then some of the music stuff would actually go to them. So I remember, I remember they, you know, they would sell or license some of the imagery that I showed. Right. 
This is a great shot of you. I think this is in San Francisco at the De Democratic National Convention in 1986. You're in the AP room, the laser photo room. Look at typewriters, no computers, no digital, nothing. And I believe you said that you helped set up the dark room. You guys would print, they'd scan. I remember in the, the movie Almost Famous where, uh, where uh, Ben Fontoris character says to um, the Cameron Crowe character, you know, uh, you know, send it to us over the mojo, right? The old wire machine. Um, I can't even imagine what it was like to transmit a photo. How, how long did it take to transmit one eight by 10 photo? Six, 16, uh, nine minutes, 16 minutes, something like that. I, it, the laser photo machine was a fax machine, essentially. Right. It was like a, it was like a high resolution fax machine. It's and, just amazing. And, the, and now, now we can send, you know, uh, I always joke, my very first computer had a hundred megabyte hard drive. Right. And nowadays, two photos on the camera I shoot with is a, more than a hundred megabytes. Right. I could have right. two photos on that. And, you know, now I've got a million, 800,000 digital files, you know? So this is you at a football game. I'm guessing here. Uh, no, this or, is the 86. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Down below. Um, yes. This is the Rose bowl. That when the Rose Boston bowl. college right. went to the Rose bowl. bowl. Yeah. Right. That was the Rose bowl when Boston college was in the Rose bowl. Yeah. And big hurricane that happened um in uh this was this was hurricane gloria i specialized in general news and i don't know if our audience knows the difference if you're on a newspaper spot news is the guy that's listening to the scanners all the time we had uh we had someone that did that um that's like what stanley foreman did who won all those pulitzer prizes for his news photos i was a general news photographer so and this, I covered is a, this is an award shot that's you in the back left there yeah. and this one is for for the hurricane co coverage yeah. Yeah. So did the whole newspaper, the whole photo department win in? A, yeah, we a, won a we won a group prize, but I won lots of um, I won lots of um, photo I, of the year. I won one. Yeah. But it, it, it's like the national press, but it was the Boston, Boston, right. New England press photographers. And as a general photographer, you got to cover people like Reagan. Here's Nancy and, and Ronnie. And here's Reagan um, and consoling a, 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 a military wife, I believe this is. And yeah, then, so that so I was in the presidential pool for the picture before. The other one was the new Gander, uh, uh, Finland, uh, where where it is Newfoundland Gander air crash um, up in uh, uh, up in Brunswick, uh, right. um, Canada, way up north. Right. Um, this uh, was and that, then, and then the Klan rally. So let's talk about the Klan rally. Were you scared shit like being in front of these guys burning crosses and? And, and or were you I just think like the press, I think the press was invited, but it was just still so surreal. You know, right. it was so surreal. And to have it in Connecticut, um, you know, it was definitely surreal. Right. And of course, so, so meaningful today with everything that's going on. All right. Let's get into some of your punk work. Here's your cover of the book that we showed before with Wendy O. Williams. We'll see those pictures again. Adam Ant. Uh, this is you with some film around your, around your, uh, now was that, was that actual fashion or were you just goofing around? I think it was, I think it was either a new year's party or a Halloween party. Got it. Um, it was a party. I, I dressed for a party. And, and I think that evening James chance and the blacks were playing or, or James chance and the contortions. He had two bands, but you know, I you know what I love about this photo is that you really look like a Coke dealer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then, and then here you are at another, probably a Halloween party or something where you're all in this Mylar suit here. Yeah. Um, and, it, and then this is the, this next one here, this is the actual Polaroid from the SX 70, the first SX 70 that the president of Polaroid gave to you. Correct. Yeah. They were a Boston okay. company, right? They were based in Cambridge. They were across the river in Cambridge. Okay. And uh, what did you think of the first Polaroid when you first took that first Polaroid? But it was it. cool. I mean, the viewfinder of the first X SX-70 was kind of weird. You know, it had this little bellows thing with a piece of leather that popped up. and But they were cool. I mean, they were really amazing. I would shoot friends. I, I, I'm sure I can find like a, a half a dozen, uh, you know, cool pictures from that camera. Right. All right. Diva wearing a mask. I'm guessing this is Mark Mother's bow. Um, uh Talk to me about um, really getting into it. So, so this is this next band here jumping up in this locker room. This is a local band. Is this the neighborhoods? Is that who this is? Yeah, so, so these are so these are in chronological order, pretty much. Seventy eight was the first concert I shot. Really, you know, Devo. I was a big fan, and then I, you know, in the scene was either shooting for Boston Rock Magazine or also being asked by. 
uh, bands to photograph them, or I was shooting for WBCN, the K-Rock station in Boston. So, uh, you know, this is a local band, the neighborhoods. The next one is a local band, um, the fabulous Billy Goons. Um, they were like, a, a, you know, wrestling, pro wrestling was big then. So they were sort of like a pseudo wrestling. That's the know, girl in the, 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 band. the tiger yeah. outfit and the socks yeah, yeah. and whatnot, yeah. right? Yeah. And then this next band, also a local band. Yeah, uh, th that's the loft I lived in with my girlfriend. This is the band Ground Zero. It was their, it. Uh, it was their uh, loft. So. Did you feel like you needed to go out and shoot anything you could, A, to sort of cut your chops and like learn how to shoot at a, a live concert? So were you willing to go shoot anything, whether it was a local band that nobody ever heard of or if it was, you know, the next photos, uh, the B-52s? Like, I mean, were you anywhere, anytime, or were you very selective in what you shot? I mean, in doing the book, what I realized is I wish I had my camera with me more often, that I didn't think of them as assignments. And and so with like Ground Zero, I'm at that party. I took some pictures, but I, I really wish I had my camera all the time because, you, you know, thing, people that weren't in the book, you know, the Smiths and you two and the psychedelic furs and, you know, you're hanging out with Tina Weymouth and uh, at a party afterwards and. Um, you know, I just wish I had documented more. Um, and, and then again, you're trying to ride that fine line. Like Billy Idol got mad because he, uh, he thought my, I, my girlfriend was asking him to take pictures backstage. Every time he would come to town, he would call me and we'd go out and I'd see the show. We'd go, I'd hang out afterwards. We'd do blow all night at his hotel room. You know, it was like a, one of those wild, uh, wild scenes. And then backstage one night, he comes screaming across the backstage, screaming top of his lungs. Yo, bloody, you keep asking me to take pictures and you're my mate. And not all the time. And he picks up like a metal uh, milk crate and flings it at my head, sticks in the drywall. I'm freaking out. And he goes, yo, girlfriend. I said, Billy, I don't have a girlfriend. He just looks at me and goes, oh. <laughs> and Bill Coin comes out, his his manager, with a gallon bag of blow. <laughs> My heart's out to like here, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and Bill goes, Billy's really sorry. He's your friend, and he that, he made a mistake, and he's really sorry. <laughs> and and Bill goes, you want some blow? <laughs> yeah if you, your heart was beating so much if you had done like, i would have it would have exploded <laughs> yeah so so, so this, we were we were hanging out i mean there were some people we were friends with but i wish i had i wish i had pushed to shoot a little more often uh where, where appropriate right so we all we all think the same thing in hindsight i look back at my archive and i'm like wait why wasn't i why wasn't I there? Wait, why didn't I take a picture of that? Wait, what's going, you know, like I had Radiohead. I did a portrait of Radiohead behind an, uh, a nightclub in San Francisco in 95 for Rolling Stone. And then th I said, hey, do you guys want to come to my studio and check out these live shots I did of you when you did a free concert in San Francisco four or five months ago? And they're like, yeah. And so all of Radiohead walks down the street with me, the two blocks from Slim's to my studio and like, I didn't take any pictures. So I'm like, well, I just did four by five portraits of them and two and a quarter possible blood portraits. Why do yeah, I need yeah, candid yeah. shots of them in my studio looking at slides on a light table, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. if we had shot, if we were shooting digital at the time, yeah, there probably would have been more pictures, right? But, you know, the <clears throat> mentality of it, and, and there's so many things I look at, I'm like, what the fuck was I thinking? Let's well, go back to some pictures. So the, 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 great, the great thing that made my life work is the Associated Press only paid $25 but you can go in the locker and just take as much film as you wanted. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'm sure there's a, I'm sure all of these punk pictures that weren't AP yes. at the time that they're shot on AP film. Absolutely. Right. Right. So the B-52, <coughs> um, this looks like it's a studio portrait, but is this backstage? Is it with studio lighting or is this? Yeah. So, so, I mean, that was my thing. It's like, I was, I realized Annie Leibovitz was becoming, uh, you know, seen a lot you know, as the chief photographer for Rolling Stone. And, you know, she was definitely one of my idols, one of my people I looked at. And, you know, there's this there's this part of you that realizes that pictures will get seen more or they're more historically important or they're just, uh, you know, more uh, more eyeballs. And, you know, you're, you're recording history if you're shooting people that are more important. So 
I realized I wasn't going to get them in the studio, but I taped a piece of, I don't know, the, the short roll of seamless, uh, th three and a half feet, four feet across right. the background. I taped it to the wall. And when they came off stage, I had a, they, they, I was there for Boston rock. They knew they were being photographed, but there was a clean wall. There wasn't enough room backstage, too many people. As they came off stage, I had an umbrella with a strobe in it and I got four frames. Right. And it's amazing. And, and, you know, the funny thing is, is that nowadays, 50 years later, and you're friends with Fred Schneider, like <coughs> wishes that you had 200 pictures from this time period, you know, everybody in hindsight at the time, you know, photography was looked at so differently back then, you know, people were like, yeah, put us in a magazine, put us in a newspaper, put us in a, you know, whatever we, you know, but, but that's it enough, like put your camera away. Whereas now everybody's like photo, 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 phone, phone, photo, backstage, social media, Instagram, content, content. People didn't think that way. I mean, I remember Beck throwing me out of a show, his manager saying, stop taking pictures. And I'm just like, you know, and then here we are 25 years later, and I'm guarantee that Beck wishes that he had photos from that show that they said no photos. Right, 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 right. And so, I, all right, I don't know, but but access was easier though too. It, things were oh, a lot definitely. more low key. Yeah, definitely. Things were a lot more low key. Look, you know, I had two things, I had three things going for me. I often had an assignment. I looked the part. I was, you know, if if you were hanging out at a radio station or everyone everyone knew me and I looked like I was part of it. And so between between the uh, looking the part, having being part of the scene and having an assignment, you know, you were invited to do, you know, stuff that normally wouldn't happen today. I mean, the next picture here of uh, Pete Shelley and um, uh, the Buzzcocks, mm -hmm. you know, that's their hotel room. You know, right. so I had an assignment to photograph them at, uh, at WTBS, which was the first punk college radio station, the Rate Lizers, Risers Club and the Demi Moan with Oedipus. And so I shot them at, in the radio station. We went back to their hotel room. I tried to do an interesting portrait in the mirror, you know, and then at night, I, a friend of mine had the first video cameras. He worked in the MIT media library, not the lab, but the media library. And I'm on stage with these guys because they know me. I'm literally on stage. Do you have right that behind. video tape? Do you still have that video tape? Yep. yep. Yeah, I'm wor we're working on getting the rights it? from the producer. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another shot of the Buzzcocks in the radio station interview. Uh, Elvis Costello on stage. The Cramps. I love these photos of the Cramps because to me, this epitomizes like that time period. It's raw. You know, this shot here is obviously with stage lighting, but this next shot where he's lying on the ground is flash on camera. You had one camera with you know, that you were going to push your film and shoot with available light, one camera that you're ready to go with a flash on camera. You were a journalist. Three cameras, three, three cameras. cameras. You always, because you always, if you were at any event and you were shooting with medium and long lenses, you always had a wide with you. Right. Uh, remember, there were no zoom lenses back then. Yeah. They didn't work well. They didn't have they were, good f-stops. They, weren't, they sharp. weren't sharp. They yeah. were terrible. Yeah. So you had to have your prime on a camera. So I that might have been a 35 millimeter with the strobe on it because I was taught in general news or or you know, you covering a political thing. Something happens. You know, you're always thinking, what if the candidate gets shot? Do you have a 24 and a flash on it to right. cover that? It's the that's, Robert. It's the Robert Kennedy um, thought process, yeah, you know, backstage. At the that's hotel. right. It's part of the thing. So I. So as you can see here, you know, the 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 wide camera had the strobe on it. Remember, I'm to the side of the stage, so the lighting's not great. So the the wide camera had the strobe on it. The long lens was available light. Right, and then you go back to this next shot, and the long lens. I'm guessing this is probably like an 85 millimeter f2 or something like that, or an I, I'm not sure. Yeah, probably. You know, it's probably not a 135 because you're. This is a small room, you know. Yeah, no. And, well, this is the channel. This is a relatively big club, but I'm still right on. You see the monitor there on the right yeah. hand side. Yeah. I'm still right yeah, on the still, side. Of the you're, stage. you're 15 feet away, so the, you know this is. You probably had a 35 and 85, and maybe your other long lens is a 135. Yeah, I was probably shooting the show with a 50 and an 85. 
and the and the strokes that other strobe picture might have been a 35, 35 he, yeah. he's landed right next to me you know right. on yeah. the picture before yeah this one yeah i'm back on it yeah and then i love this one where his pants are coming down like what is going on was he just was this theater was this an accident i mean this is a i I, I only saw them once it was probably one of my favorite shows in my life i love the cramps I, mm -hmm. I had a friend the editor of boston rock my friend tristram lozow he would have nitrous oxide parties right and, uh, you know, I'd go with Johnny Angel, my friend, Johnny Angel, a musician. We'd go to uh, the, the place that sold nitrous oxide to make whipped cream for the stores. We'd show him a business card. We had business card pr printed up uh -huh. and, and we'd listen to all we'd listen to is the cramps because the music, you know, that wah, 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 went so well with nitrous oxide at a nitrous oxide party. So I'm like, I'm a huge fan of the cramps and I had never seen them before. And slowly, like you notice his belt comes off, his pants fall down by the time you're going and he's on the ground here. We, we there on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he's, he's got no clothes on and he's yeah. performing with no clothes on, you know? And part of my mantra was always to go to backstage and do a portrait because a portrait meant you were important. And the pictures were port important because you were given access. Right. You were invited in backstage to someone's life. Right. And this shot here, there's the bathroom sink, the slop sink. And is that <clears throat> I mean, what's going on here? He's, he's uh, well, he had no clothes, so he put his dick in a hot dog bun, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and showed it to you. <laughs> OK, rock and roll, baby. Fucking the cramps. Yeah. And then this is Poison Ivy backstage. Beautiful portrait. And is this like, I mean, is this one frame, two frames? Like this is a, it's a I, we, I shot like a little sequence of her. She posed. I like right. this the best um, it bounce flash. And I, you know, at the time we were, you can only bounce flash if you had walls that weren't black backstage. So, so this was the channel it had, you know, white ceilings and white walls, a lot of graffiti. I mean, but, the, the interesting thing yeah. is, is that people back then, like even bouncing a flash off the ceiling was somewhat cutting edge most people were just pointing that flash right at you harsh straight ahead where did you come up with that idea to even do something like that were you already thinking about studio lighting as a 20 year old kid or 19 whatever old you were well, well look at it look at it this way right from a psychological standpoint if you want your pictures to feel like you were given access and you're an important person because they gave you time they can't look like they were shot with a strobe, with a flash on camera, because right. if they look like they're shot with a flash on camera, right, our audience is going to realize this. It looks like it was a snapshot. Right. But if you could create studio lighting in right. uh, in a backstage situation. So if you look under her right shoulder camera left, you could see the shadow of the flash card, sure. right? I've got a little flash card on there. It was a piece of plexiglass that I can on Velcro raise up or down, depending on how much front light I needed. Right. So there's a little front light coming from your flash on your plexiglass. And it's also because the flash is facing sh straight up. It's also. And then there's the light. overall light yeah. coming down. And nowadays, you know, a flash on camera has <coughs> angles, you know, it could be straight up. It could be like this. It could be like this. It could be like that. Right. But back then it was either this or this, you know, there was no, no, the Vivitars would go in different directions. Oh, they're right. The 283 or the 285 did that. The, the 283, 283 would, would have different directions halfway. Uh, it didn't have a locking mechanism at the in between points, but you could. We would, yeah, it. we would hold. We would hold right. it. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So then um, here's a shot of Nick Lowe and Elliot Easton from the cars. Um, did you shoot a lot of color back then or was this like an uh, 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 odd thing for you? Well, you know, I was with Picture Group and Picture Group, even though Boston Rock was only a black and white magazine and mm -hmm. and WBCN, when they sent out press pictures, they really only needed black and white. But my agent always wanted me to shoot color because they would try to license or syndicate this stuff. And the they knew I was in situations that they knew I was in situations that other people weren't invited to. These were always private parties in the VIP lounge at Spit. Now, Spit, even though this wall is a little purplish, Spit was predominantly black. Every wall was black. So if you're asking why I didn't bounce flash here, there was nothing to bounce a light off of, right? It right. was, it's only that you would have gotten nothing back. Right, right. And and you're, this is a color slide, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, we if, if if our audience doesn't know, I started shooting black and white film, and then when you were shooting color, you were shooting transparency, and then there was a movement to shoot uh, color negative, 
and late cross 90s, processing. Early 2000s, yeah. You know, there was a there was a movement to not just shoot slide because you had more flexibility and color negative was a look and and magazines were willing to take the time and get prints. And then you had to learn a digital workflow. Each one of those workflows is different, right? It's absolutely. It's, it's, you know, you overexpose, you expose for the shadows on the black and white. You have to make sure you don't blow out the highlights on the color. You know, when you were processing, you would clip test, you know, it, there was a whole right. different workflow. The that. other thing that people don't understand or might not, might not know <coughs> is that slide film transparencies, which is this shot, is that your exposure latitude is like a half a stop, right? So if you're yeah. a half a stop overexposed or a half a stop underexposed, your photo is essentially ruined. Whereas in color negative film, you have probably three stops in either direction where you can be underexposed or probably three stops overexposed and one and a half stops underexposed and still get a decent print out of it, right? So you really had to have your shit together and understand how to expose color slide film. And when you're doing it with a flash on camera, you had to do tests and you had to understand distances and the sensors on the flash to know how it was going to react if they're wearing all black versus if they're wearing all white, because the flash would bounce off and it'd be read by this very analog little uh, sensor, this little uh, photo eye that would turn the flash on or off, putting out more power or less power. And you had to learn all the intricacies of the room you were in, the space you were in, you know, how much highlight was in the shot, how much shadow was in the shot to really make it work and get the right exposure. Yes. And all while focusing the camera. <laughs> right. Manually. Manually. Of course. Manually yeah. focusing a, the camera. In a dark room where there was no light. Yeah. <laughs> We all would right. carry flashlights with us so we could see, like, you know, you had all these tricks. Right. Let's keep cruising through because we're we're already getting close to, you know, we're, we're already 40 minutes in and you have a lot of photos you want to show. So I'm going to cruise through a few photos and then we'll stop in a minute okay. again. This is the Human League. Human League. Next, uh, this is the Human League with the backlighting also. Right. And then uh, Killing Joke. Is that what this is? Yep. Right. This guy with the screaming at the mic. Uh, yep. And Killing Joke backstage again. Right. Such a Great classic. I loved, I did a bunch of portraits at the I-Beam, which was on Haight Street in San Francisco. And this is what these backstages looked like, these kinds of rooms, which are just great. Yeah, this is the chat. This is the channel. That's the classic channel. Right. You know, <laughs> Pill Pill puts the, you know, and I shot Pill back there in the right. show. And I didn't realize you know. the Public Image Limited went back that far. I don't think I shot them until f till the first time, until like the late 80s or 90s. I didn't realize. Oh, the, oh no, 81, 82, yeah. Right, so I didn't realize that right when the Sex Pistols ended, Public Image Limited started. Uh, this is Lena Lovitch. Um, yeah. Portrait, um, her portrait of her again, color portrait, back on stage with her. Um, are, yeah, you so spending, often, are you spending a whole day with her? Like, what yeah, do you do? So, so often I would get these assignments for Boston Rock Magazine to go and photograph her while she's doing publicity. Maybe the writer's interviewing her at her hotel. Or So I, the last thing I want to do is take a picture of someone being interviewed. Like that's death, right? That's horrible. So I then walk around and figure out where I can photograph her on the steps and in the pool at the pool at her hotel. And, you know, I come up with scenarios. I think I shot her twice. I, you know, in one case, I even brought, you know, black backdrop here, black velvet, maybe, and and lit her. So the idea is, again, to look like you've been granted access and have uh, portraits, you know, that might be in the studio, like you're, you know, you're taking something that's more important than just taking a concert picture or, uh, you know, a flash on camera picture. So, but then at the end of the evening, you're, you're with talent, you know, on stage, uh, shooting them. If you'd like to come to the show backstage, potentially those sort of things. When you're hanging out with an artist during the day, I mean, this is the seventies. Are you guys smoking weed, snorting Coke, hanging out, shit like that during the yeah, day? Yeah, try not to do a lot of Coke during the day, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, sometimes, it, but, you, but, you, but you were able to separate work from play and, and, and be a yeah. survivor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, when I got the job at the Herald, I had to stop doing Coke. I mean, it, it right. I, I don't remember. I guess we everyone smoked a little bit of pot. You know, right. it was just common. It was not a big deal. But you, you were know. able to keep that separation and not just be part of the party and, and to be professional. Well, at one point when, I, you know, getting a staff job at a newspaper when you've been studying, you know, sort of apprenticing as a photojournalist, that was like the coolest like that was a pinnacle of my career so i stopped doing drugs but no i mean there would be mornings man i remember one morning you know because you'd go to bed at four or five and you didn't sleep well when you're doing a lot of blow and and vin albiso who was the 
uh, director of the Boston Bureau at the Associated Press called me up at like 5 a.m. He's like, Greco, the GM plant in, in Framingham is closing. Uh, you need to be there at six. I'm like, okay, Vin, all right. Click. <laughs> 10 a.m., my head springs up. It's like, holy Christ. <laughs> uh, uh, Rick <laughs> from the Cars, um, Lou Reed, um, Susie and the Banshees, just amazing with that fringe jacket. Uh, Backstage portrait of Susie. Aren't you wearing a T-shirt of this one right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah love that. Love that. I go to Michael's website and uh, check that Day, out. What's your website, Michael? Day, it's daysofpunk.com. And when you hit the hamburger, the menu, uh, the third section is our fashion section, and it has all our. Uh, I mean, all this, our... this portrait of them is just so unbelievably beautiful. I mean, I, <sighs> I was able to do one portrait of Susie. Um, uh, do you know the famous portrait? I believe it's. Alfred Eisenstadt, the guy, the photo with the uh, the lace in front of it. Is that who did that portrait? Um, I have that. I I I, I think Swanson. Stephen Klein did a version of that with smoking, and um, I have the Eisenhat one, the Eisenstadt one downstairs in my house. Right, that's with Gloria Swanson. I did a portrait of Susie. No, that's Steichen. That's that was Steichen. Steichen. Oh, okay, got it. I did a portrait of Susie and the, Susie Sue with the lace in front of her face. In like the early '90s, I believe it was. So that's my beautiful, one, my one portrait of her, and of course, you know, homage to the other ones that we just talked about. Um, uh, the specials on stage, uh, British British band, right? Specials, uh, ska band, and that was the oh, other yeah. thing we were into was the English beat, the specials, Selector, um, th that ska movement out of England. Me and my friends were like really into also. So the Rude Boy movement. So and. You know, this is the behind the Bradford ballroom, the next image with the, right, glass, the, wall. On that one. Yeah, the glass. Yeah, the glass blocks. Yeah. The glass wall behind them. And you see, I ran a light through that. You see the little light hitting his face? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I was always oh, yeah. interested. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you have a strobe going behind the glass blocks. Otherwise, yeah. you couldn't see the glass, right? If it, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, we've all done know. that one. Glass blocks are fun, for sure. Um, and then we get to the talking heads. We have David Byrne and Adrian Ballou, which is my favorite talking heads period, 1980 remain in light. Uh, is this just backstage at a show? No, I was asked to go up. It was an assignment for Boston rock. David knew I was coming. It was the Copley Plaza hotel. I went up to Adrian was there in the lobby. I just picked a spot at the Copley Plaza. It's almost like where the stairs are, where you walk in on the side. It was kind of quiet. And I had to go get David when I was ready. So I came upstairs and he's there with like a T-shirt and pants, like very clean cut um, and listening to pygmy music on a cassette replayer, <laughs> on a cassette player. And, and I mean, this is that I forget his world music label, but this is right around that time when he uh -huh. had that world music label and he's okay. listening to this. And we really didn't hear know what pygmy music was before this. I had to ask him, I'm like, David, what is that? It's like, oh, th those are the pygmies of, you know, whatever. Uh, right. And it was pretty rad, actually. And he's yeah. very, you know, soft spoken. Is this, is this window light coming in from their side? No, strobe to the side on the wall. Got it. Just hitting the wall. Right. Yeah. All right. I mean, huge, huge Adrian Blue <coughs> fan. Um, uh, I've had a couple opportunities to, to photograph um, uh, David Byrne. And uh, he came, you know, he used to, when he would visit cities, he would ride around on a bicycle you know, he had like a folding bike and he would ride. Uh, he did a book called The Bicycle Diaries. And uh, he came to my studio in his bike helmet on his bike uh, and rang the doorbell. And my assistant handed him a package, thought he was a bike messenger because we were expecting one. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. My name is David. I'm here for a photo shoot. But David is, is, you know, he really gets into the photo shoot. He really gives you a lot. He understands the concept of it, the creativity behind it. I mean, he's fucking David Byrne, you know, and uh, so just brilliant, you know, early David Byrne, Adrian Blue, 1980-ish portrait. And then this is, I believe, Stop Making Sense Tour in 83, I think, right? Um, I believe so, yeah. At, uh, I forget the, the, the location, but yeah. Right. David and Tina, then Tina Solo. Um, and then this is Bow Wow Wow. Is that the next the shot? Slits. The Slits. Oh, the Slits. Okay, got it. Sorry. What is Bow Wow Wow all women or no? It's not no, right. Bow Wow Wow. The slits were all women. Okay, got it. <clears throat> Bow Wow Wow uh, was just the, the, their notoriety. They're another Malcolm McLaren band. Their notoriety was she was 16 years old. Bow Wow so, Wow. No, she was 13 years old when she started. Bow Wow so, Wow. <clears throat> Bow Wow Wow. That was their notoriety. Where, where were the slits from? England. 
right. the, if I remember correctly, John Lydon, um, John Lydon's wife of many years who just passed, Right. The woman on the left, the lead singer uh, with the with the dreads, uh -huh. um, was was her daughter. So she's actually Johnny's John Lydon's uh, Johnny Rotten's stepdaughter, and she passed of cancer too several wow. years ago. Sad. And then, uh, all right. So the fingerprints, right? Oh yeah. So they, they, that's the that's the slits uh, performing live before that, and we've got fingerprints i think this is at an after hours club in new york at like 6 a.m got it and then uh, <clears throat> that's why you've sort of got this like scene with the guy on the floor yeah i mean this shot here this is just such a classic shot i mean and the, and the other photographer in the background i mean if it's 6 a.m out like, almost look at yeah like yeah i mean just like just such a great thing and if and it's probably like a like a ska thing the guy with the plaid pants you know he's probably like this is some you know crazy like uh um, you know, future mighty, mighty Boston's things. And then you get to the plasmatics, which I mean, I remember reading about them in magazines and I was a hippie and we were more on the LSD front than, you know, anything else. And, uh, but I was so intrigued by this woman that she would be on stage and she would like, you know, was so wild and would, would, you know, roll around on, on broken glass. Like here's the shot where she's topless with the drum on top of her. And then here she is like half naked with shaving cream. I'm guessing that is all over her. That's shaving you know, and I'm like, cream. who is this woman like on stage? Like, what is this punk rock thing? And the women are showing their tits and like, like what the fuck is going on? And I just like, didn't understand it, but I was so intrigued by it. You know, like what were the plasmatics like live? Was it? Well, I, I mean, I, uh, she, one of the points in her show, she takes a shotgun and with blanks in it, obviously, but shoots it and it right next to my head. And I couldn't hear anything for like two weeks afterwards on that, <laughs> on that ear. So I went out and got sonic reducers after that. It was like, right. I could not, I knew that this would be the death of me. Um, but I, you know, musically they were kind of more heavy on the heavy metal side, I think, but she was just, you know, she was just, uh, she was the Alice Cooper of punk. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, just such a so visual again, like that cramp shot. I, I'm on the shot with her, her, again, where she's rolling around the ground with the drum on top of her. Just amazing. Um, for me, I lost my hearing at Living Color at the I-Beam on Hate Street, small club in front of Vernon Reed's amp for two hours. My ears rang for a week, week and a oh half. My God. And then I went out and got earplugs after that and started wearing earplugs. Um, and then I love this shot of Wendy o. Williams, with, you know, the feedback with the smoke and the guitar against the amp. I mean, this this could have been your book cover also like this shot really could have been a book cover. Hey, we you, want it. You know, the interesting thing is there were so many women in punk back then, which is right. amazing. Um, and they wanted to be more uh, we wanted to be more, you know, female empowering and, you know, chose the the, the picture with the. Uh, right. And then that's, the that's, that's these next two shots. And you and you and I talked about this shot. You're the first one, <clears throat> which is without a strobe before she's cracking the screen. And what you told me is actually the strobe went off, but just a tiny bit. It hadn't recycled. The batteries hadn't recycled the flash all the way. And so it's sort of an in-between shot, but you're still able to pull enough detail, you know, versus the next one, which is the cover of the book where the strobe went off fully. And, you know, back then, like nowadays, if I was shooting in a small club, I would never in a million years use a flash on camera because it's such a no-no. But back then in these clubs at this time, when the lighting was a couple of little cans up on the stage, and it was okay to shoot with a flash on camera. Nobody cared, you know, nobody really, nobody thought twice about it. It was, it was actually part of the experience, part of the scene to have one or two photographers up front, you know, shooting with their 35 millimeters with flash on camera. So this shot of, of Wendy o. Williams, you know, from the, from the plasmatics breaking the, breaking the television monitor. And was, was this a promo, like a promo stunt? Yeah, for, for there's the K-Rock station in Boston, WBCN. And, you know, I was doing a lot of publicity shoots for them. Um, <clears throat> my friend David Bieber ran the promotions department. And, I, you know, his friends, all of those DJs started at TBS and Ted Turner bought the call letters. It, it's become WMBR. But Oedipus, Carla Nolan, Alberto, Tom Lane, Tony V, all the, they were the first they had the first punk college radio station in the world, or, or at least in the U.S., I shouldn't say the world. So um, 
they all went over to BCN. So at you know, I it's like hanging out. You know, you're hanging out and with them. At, this this next it, shot of Adam, Adam Ant in a radio station. What station is this? So this is this is WTBS. That's Greg okay. Reedman, and uh -huh. this is the Late Risers Club. So this is another one of those situations where I'm assigned for Boston Rock to hang out as. Adam does his interview with the writer and get pictures of him. So this is a little documentary of him um, at WMBR. This is him. The next one is outside the columns of MIT, right? Uh -huh. Then we go over to WBCN with the two dr with the band. I did blow all night after the show with the is two this not just a band or is there a radio DJ in here? Yeah, also? Oedipus. Oedipus is against the wall with those mutton chops of his. Got it. Okay. Got it. And, and he's, um, the, he's the DJ. And other than that, the other five guys are the band. Yeah. Right. Two and drummers. Then, that was Adam's big thing. He had that sound of two drummers, you know. Right. Right. Big and sound. then the next shot is him, <clears throat> another backstage candid portrait. Flash. Yeah, probably setting up at, at the Paradise. And then this is him on stage at the Paradise that evening. Right. Amazing. And then we get <laughs> Crash, the most epic band. Um, uh, they're still me, my favorite. They're my favorite. You know, it's tell like. Me, tell me. You, we have a handful of photos here. Just start talking about your relationship with the Clash, and and you know, here, uh, well, it, it wasn't that personal. But but we so Tristram Lozow from from Boston Rock wanted to shoot the band. They had a two week gig at Bonds, and we couldn't figure out how to get there. And then one of Tris's friends, Anne Marie, was friends with Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols. So we all drove down. The four of us drove down, crashed uh, from Boston, four hour drive at night, crashed on a floor. I, I slept on a floor with Steve Jones from uh, the Sex Pistols. Uh, you know, next day, you know, we pull our shit together and, and you know, uh, eat and we see the show because I had passes from the magazine to shoot the show. What and then the we're, venue? what was the venue? Bonds. Bonds. It was like a disco uh you know, it was a it was a New York club that doesn't exist anymore. They closed right. it after this, but right. they had a two week engagement from The Clash, which was originally supposed to be a couple of nights, but they oversold tickets mm -hmm. and The Clash agreed to do it. So then we're backstage with Steve Jones and Steve Jones is telling the bouncer, yeah, you know, it's it's Jonesy from the Sex Pistols. Can we get in? And we were like, ah, so. And then again, you're you're with Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols. So it's like, you know. You're, you're let in, you're cool, you know, you look the part, you have friends, you're, you know, so we're hanging out with the band. That was the first show. And you is, know, that, is, that the, is that the first portrait, the one where uh, Strummer's got his hand up by his face? Is that at the, is that at Bonds or is this down at the one at Cape Cod or? Um, the, the, I, I, if you go, so the group shot we were talking about with Ken Reagan, go, go to that. Yeah, that's what I'm on right now. Okay. So that was at, yeah, that was at Bonds. And, okay. Ken got them all together to do a portrait. I wanted, we all both try to work to get a portrait. We talked about that. Ken Regan was backstage also, and he had, uh, that's his strobe I'm catching because we're both shooting so many At shots. Same time. That's so. why there's that hard light on the guy all the way on the left. And right. for those of you guys who don't know, Ken Regan is a very renowned photographer. He's the guy that documented all of Bob Dylan on the, on the, um, uh, you know, blood on the tracks period, uh, the, the rolling thunder tour, you know, really the Bob Dylan guy. And he passed away a number of years ago from cancer, but one of the truly most brilliant photographers. I mean, Ken is just unbelievably. He was a big news photographer. He had his, he had his agency camera five. I mean, the interesting thing for me from a personal note, uh, when I was working for the Herald and I shot the Maria Shriver wedding and the Carolyn Kennedy wedding, uh -huh. he had Mike Fuller from camera five, his agency and him covering that wedding. People had hired them and people had to pick up pictures from me. I had <laughs> pictures that they both didn't have. And then Beth Filler from People Magazine said, if you ever leave the Herald, I will hire you. And within a few months, I called her up and it's like, Beth, I'm moving to L.A. Like, <laughs> I'm out of here. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. All right. So beautiful <laughs> portrait backstage. This shot of Joe Strummer here sitting on the couch, the cigarette, the cup, the tennis ball. I mean, this is such an important document of this time period. I mean, this photograph means a lot to me. I can't even imagine what it means to so many people. I mean, just the look on his face. Um is this you throwing your flash off to the left again onto a wall? Or do you think this is just available light with what's going no, on? No, it's up. It's up. And my hand is like, 
this. So you know, you're, it's holding, like, you're holding your flash up in the air. Right? So the, the shadow is the flash card that comes up above the strobe, right? The strobe's right, yeah. here right. and there's that little piece of plastic. But the, there's that overall light that comes down and fills in behind his head. And this, this, this portrait just and also seeing the shoulders of the people next to him or the hands and the shoulder. I mean, everything about this photograph is just phenomenal. I mean, I can't even tell you how mind-blowing to me this photograph is it, it I mean, makes me very sad to look at it though and think he's passed so early like yeah. that, that's like um and then here's the second portrait um where was this one from so my buddy oedipus the dj that was back there every once in a while he'd call me up and go let's go see joan jett at the cape cod coliseum let's go see the clash at the cape cod coliseum he would want a driving buddy so i'd get in his little mazda rx7 and we'd go to the cape and here again i didn't really have an assignment on this one because uh, you know maybe boston rock used them or whatever but i was with oedipus and we got backstage passes and we were hanging out so i'm on the stage with the clash in that photograph i'm literally standing on the stage you know the 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 color one yeah the, yeah. the one after joe strummer yep yep so yeah. then then we're backstage this is the combat rock tour and i was there twice because the f they, they had two shows and the next night i went home and i printed this and I had them sign it the next day for me. And it's sitting in my office here, all Amazing. signed. So, and then, and, and, then, uh, and then Mick Jones with, yep. uh, you know, the British press know who that is. That was his girlfriend at the time. And I guess she's a model of, or someone of renown, but, but yeah, I, I always wonder what drug she was doing, sucking on her thumb like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, human sexual response. Um, say no more. <laughs> Uh, you know, they 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 would have been the B-52s also of the era, but the they didn't want to pay a manager. They had Don Rose. I, they're very close friends of mine, but I will say this. They had Don Rose from Ryko Ryko Disc, the, uh -huh. you know, early on Don managed bands and they didn't want to pay him his 10 percent. And they dumped them and they then they self-managed and they they couldn't put, they, they and they were so cool. They were uh, so cool. We went on with Oedipus and myself and I was dressed in like, you know, this one piece uh, outfit with, you know, like I was with the with the green and we were all dark glasses and we were on a TV show five all night live all night. And I was part of the fashion group uh, that this woman, Nancy Pants, they did a whole thing on punk. And they were treating the band like crap. They were treating everyone like crap. Oedipus was with us. They were treating everyone like crap. So the second song they did live was I Want a Butt Fuck on live TV in Boston. <laughs> and they, it took them a while, you know, and the host was like dancing and singing and they cut to the host doing it. And then someone whispers in his ear, hey, we got to shut this down, you know? It's like <laughs> oh my God. And then what um, is this this one here backstage with uh, someone putting makeup on in the in the mirror? Uh, so I was close friends with Dean and Wendell, the two the two guys in the background, still close friends with them. Um, Dennis Deanie Lamo, um, his stage name. Um, uh, is this human sexual response? Also, yeah, this is oh, this okay. is. This is backstage. And I was sort of their official photographer. We went in 1980. They were on the old gray whistle test. We went to uh -huh. London together uh -huh. um, and I traveled with them. I was friends with them. We drove to New York. Um, you know, this is the, this is backstage at Jonathan Swift's in Cambridge. The one um, with the, with the, the girl with the balloon. No, the one before it, but the okay. girls with the balloons was just at one of the party, one of their parties that's, or, or backstage, that's uh, Casey Cameron um, with the crown behind her. Um, then this is when they signed their first record deal with Ryko Disc with Don's label. Um, um, the champagne and, 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 the, and the limo. And that's Oedipus, right. So right. I traveled the world with them. Uh, Amazing. You know, I traveled the world with them. There were two local bands that I was sort of, became the prominent photographer of so semi-official photographer and it was them until right. Tuesday. So right. some people, some people aspire to be Queens photographer and you aspire to be human sexual responses. For <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then we get to Joan Jett. I'm going to cruise through some of these to pick up some time here. Uh, the Ramones, of course, how can you, how can you have a punk rock book without the Ramones? Um, just great, amazing, classic Joey. I only got to photograph them twice, I think. Um, and then after the Ramones, we have the undertones, um, squeeze, 
just, uh, you know, which is funny that you have them, I guess they would fall into the new wave category of your, of your book title, but they're really such like, to me, they're, they're, a pop band. I mean, their songs are just smooth as butter, you know, but yeah. But where do you draw the line? Like, what do you say about the jam? What, but what what happened? Yeah. Their songs are clever squeeze, right? Their hooks Uh are clever, but at the same time, you know, uh, Sting says this, that if it wasn't for punk, we wouldn't exist because the airwaves didn't open up until, until the commercial stations had to start playing the things, the college radio stations were playing. Right. You know, Squeeze still did, wouldn't have fit the format of album oriented rock radio. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. And p- the police clearly not a punk band, you know, but that, but, you know, not even a new wave band, but sort of thrown into that category when they came over to America in 79, 80, 81. Yeah, somewhere. they were kind of punkish at the very beginning, yeah. you know, so. Not like the Dead Kennedys, which is what we're looking at right here. <laughs> Jello Biafra, which is just, you know, love Jello. Um, these are just great shots. And again, flash on camera. So you're really seeing the crowd, that woman that's sort of climbing up on somebody behind Jello. Um, it looks like this is maybe his security people trying to pull him back out of the audience because they've got their claws deep into him. Uh, I, and I love this shot with Jello on stage and those two people, you know, the girl and the guy and the guy just like raging. I mean, you know, the energy it shows like this Um uh, it's it was unbelievable and i and it looks like a lot of the shows you shot you were just on the stage with these guys at the i beam on hate street which is where i shot a lot of the punk stuff that i shot i was always i did the same thing i was sometimes on the stage like sound garden and bands like that in the early days um but i was right in front also getting crushed against the stage a lot of times i've had cameras broken and flashes broken and lenses broken from you know just the crush of the madness but the photos that i have of things like this as well i i know this energy right here i feel this energy and this photograph of jello with these people the story in this photograph, you know, a thousand words. This is like a million word essay, this photograph right here of Jello. Thank you. Thank and you these so people. much. And then Jello jumps out into the crowd again. Uh, and then backstage, you're in that same room with the PIL that we saw earlier, um, you know, with the towel on his head. Um, I love the attitude in his face. Uh, yeah. It's like, I, you know, it's like uh, that swarmy, you know, Jello attitude. And uh, strobe, strobe off the ceiling with the flash sure. card, same technique. Yeah, looks great. Um, and then who is this here? An- this Annabella Lewin, the 13-year-old Annabella Lewin. Right, this is the bow, wow, wow that I, yeah. I mixed up. Right, and, and I'm just using a long lens backstage outside, actually outside behind the paradise. Right, which is great. You know, shallow depth of field, everything just goes out of focus. Beautiful portrait. I mean, and, you know, this woman is, you know, this woman is 55, six, seven years old now, you know, something like that. It's just amazing. I love this shot also. I mean, you know, the, the haircut on the guy in the back, right? I mean, again, this is the epitome of this time period. This just says so much about. It, this you know, is one of my favorite, you know, that's the corner. I mean, this is where that's a corner in the, at the paradise of backstage. You can see the line there yep, of course, and, yeah. and very pe- Irving Penn inspired, right? Yeah. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you if you were aware of the Irving Penn. Yeah, yeah, no, very Irving Penn. Uh, no, I, I grew up at 13 and 14, looking at all those classics i mean right. it, I, it, it's a, i have an amazing life now that i'm friends with someone like bruce davidson but for the past 50 years i've been looking at his right. work like, so let me ask you a question um are you an avidon guy or a pen guy avidon <laughs> funny interesting <laughs> i was a pen guy always but i've now i'm as much an avidon guy as a pen guy i, I mean a pen Pen was amazing. Pen was amazing too, and and Helmet, you know, Helmet Newton was yeah, of amazing. course. Well, I mean, Helmet, I mean, is in a class of his own, but but you know, Avedon and Pen had that whole rival rivalry going in the fifties, forties, fifties, sixties between Harper's and 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 Vogue, and you know that whole thing that eventually Avedon came over from Harper's, and just you know, but just both of them truly, truly brilliant, and you know, some of my favorite work to go back and revisit, you know, when I'm looking for inspiration, I open up those coffee table books of both of those guys are just, you know, to me, they're my heroes, you know, in terms of portraiture. And there's so many other people that inspire me, you know, um, you know, Bailey and Albert Watson, and even people like you and Frank Ockenfels and Mark Seliger, you know, so many, Annie, I mean, the list goes on and on. But if you were to go back, you know, my first true, true 
true love was Irving and, and Irving Penn. And, and well, we, you talked about you, 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 uh, there was a wonderful compliment you gave me um, when we were setting up the other day about being one of the first ones um, to be into lighting in, in my portraiture, you know, and um, it, you know, and Annie really wasn't into like real technical lighting, but I was, I was into how to make, lighting part of the concept in the picture but you know i was of a small group of photographers that were all friends and we all knew each other uh frank was it was frank ockenfels and i want to pay frank a great uh you know great compliment uh his work is amazing and max aguilera hellwig remember max sure, of course remember so that series he did of the surgeries oh my god but so he went from portraits with this crazy lighting and I loved his stuff and I would look at it and it's like I'd love his crazy stuff and then um and then he got it started shooting the surgeries and, be and became a doctor eventually right, because yeah. it was so fascinating so yeah but we were a small we were a, a small little group of like people who are really into you know very Elaborate lighting, lighting. And, yeah. and and for those of you guys that are watching very shortly we're going to get into some of this really intense lighting stuff that michael did in his hollywood hollywood work post punk so stick around don't disappear and remember if you have questions for michael send them in we've got harrison and joe aggregating your questions and pulling them off of the facebook and youtube and whatever um one last thing about max wasn't he the guy that did all the production stills on the Un unbearable lightness of being no, that was Antonin Kratokville, I believe. Oh, that was, oh, Kratokville, Lori's ex-husband, right? Yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, anyway, so I'm going to cruise through a little bit. I'm going to speed it up a little bit, Michael, because we have so many more and photos to look at and talk about. Bow, wow, wow, backstage. Um, bow, wow, wow, on stage. Uh, this Martha is Martha Davis. Davis from the motels. Right. Um, Martha on stage. Uh, again, Martha on stage shooting some color. Is this you putting your lights up in the in the in the lighting grid for this shot here, you think? You know, I was just thinking that myself. If I don't think so. Not at this club. It was easy to do at the Paradise because Ron Ponnell, uh, the music photographer in Boston, had strobes in there already, and they would let you do it um, because it was done. I think this was just a well-lit show at the Metro or Spit. There were two clubs on Lansdowne Street. One was the Black Punk Rock Club. It was all mm -hmm. black inside. The other one was like a royal blue theme, and it was Metro. It was the Disco Club, and they'd have shows on either side, though. Right. Amazing. All right. Cruising right along. This is still Martha backstage. Right? Yeah, a, a party for the release of the Motels right. album. Early New Order, and of course, you know, this is uh, out of the ashes of Joy uh, uh, Joy Division, uh, yeah. Bernard Sumner and Peter Hook from New Order in the early days. Uh, here's Johnny Rotten in uh, Public Image Limited. Um, again, here's Pill. There's uh, there's Mr. J Mr. Rotten out down front. And, you know, like this is a cool shot. But that other one we were talking about with Jello, like just the look on the faces. This is just such a different story. You know, he's got the microphone. He's letting some guy in the audience sing. It looks like and every, it's a it's a it's a light moment versus that intense angst moment. Like putting those two pictures next to each other is just such a you know dichotomy between those those vibes that are going on. Uh, well, John, lo John loves to be a pr provocateur. Like, look right. at the next picture. Like, yeah. he just loves being a provocateur. He loves being, um, you know, challenging and making faces and saying things he shouldn't. Yeah, and, I, I did one portrait of him in the early 90s, and he's got his eyeballs popping out of his head and his big spiked mohawk. And I always say that he looks like Bart Simpson in that photograph. Uh, Billy Idol. Um, and I know, Billy, you talked about Billy earlier and how good of friends you were. But this is when you started putting the strobes up in the uh, in the rafters there. Yeah, right? this the, is the par this is the paradise. And there's strobes up in the rafters here. And just just I mean, er, what year is this? Um, I'm 80, 82, 81. Right. So 82. just also the technology of strobe lights in 1981, 82 was still so new, so simple that that to, for you to be able to do that and, and remote trigger it, that was pretty early technology and that you figured yeah, out. You'd hardwire, you'd hardwire all the strobes together. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. I forget if you ran them in series or parallel, but you hardwired all the triggers together and then you would have a rate one radio. There were radio remotes then. You would have right. one radio set to set off and you'd have to put the, like if they were Vivitar 283s, this is a smaller stage. You know, the, you knew the Sports Illustrated guys were doing it. So so we knew I could do it. You know, I just knew. Right. 
So, you know, then you would then you would have to have batteries for the Vivitars because you like separate batteries, big batteries, because you didn't they wouldn't fire if not, you know. Right. I didn't realize we were doing a little flash on camera Vivitar 283s. I thought you were using like big studio strokes. No, still, no, that, that's but, a room. But still, but still you had to engineer this with the right clamps and the right because yeah, all, yeah. that, all that stuff also came later on in our careers, like grip equipment and clamps to clamp onto everything with hooks and you know, all that stuff. Like, I'm sure you were like jury, you know, you were MacGyvering things together left and right. Yeah, we had like grip equipment and, you know, you'd put a chain on it so it didn't fall. And on somebody's you know. head. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Another Billy Idol shot. That's just really great. Billy Idol portrait backstage. So this is the Irving Penn corner at the exactly. Paradise exactly. upstairs yeah. in the dressing room. So yeah. and for those I, of you guys I, don't know what we're talking about, just go look up Irving Penn portraits. on <clears> See. He put two big flats together that he had carpeting on and did all these famous portraits in this. But he thing. put them, but he put them in such a way that they weren't at a 90 degree angle. Right. He made them go closer like oh, this. Yeah. So he forced them into this like weird place. And there's great portraits of Truman and Capote and everyone. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, and then uh, Madness. We have Madness uh, right here. Uh, madness backstage. We have David Bowie, one of the fewer arena shows. You didn't really shoot a lot of arena shows. You were kind of hanging out in small clubs. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, is this the Bowie show in the stadium, actually? Yeah, it's Foxborough Stadium. Got it. So stadium show, which was rare for Michael. Um, and then we get to uh, Big Country, right? This is Big right. Country. And then we're going to roll into Till Tuesday. And this is another band that you did a lot of work with in 83, 84. This is Amy Mann, who was, you know, became a kind of a renowned solo artist, more Americana rock. Yeah. So, so this, so this portrait, this black and white portrait on the uh, parking meters was for Boston rock. We were all friends. We used to hang out at the hoodoo barbecue uh, together, which was the upstairs restaurant in the rat. Then the next portrait underneath we did, the uh, Boston Herald Sunday magazine was doing a story on the band and they, they knew I was friends and they, I was the guy to do the studio lighting. I shot a lot of the covers to the Boston Herald magazine because I could shoot color and knew how to light. So I shot them then. And then I sort of became the de facto official photographer in their early years. Uh, the next one is on their video set. This is the Voices Carry video. I went on tour with them uh, with Hall & Oates, which is the the... The, I, this might be the Bradford Ballroom, but I did go on tour with them uh, in New York and Philadelphia. And then e even in those situations, I would try to set up, you know, a light and a scenario. You know, there's that strobe with the orange gel behind them, right, yeah. you know, and, and, and so a, this is just a backstage portrait, right? Correct. Right. And Correct. you're just documenting everything that's going on. You're being a photojournalist. You're doing onstage. Stuff yeah, but a photojournalist that, that wanted to always do more. I, right. I always wanted to shoot that, you know, that portrait. Right. And that's why, you you know, you ended up with the with the career that you had. Uh, Warren Zane from the Del Fuegos. Um, uh, what is this band here afterwards? Um, uh, Gang Green. Gang Green. Oh, with, the De with the Del Fuegos T-shirt. Yeah. Gang Green out of Boston. Um uh, they won the Boston WBCN Boston Battle of the Bands. Um, you know, they were fun. And is this a whole series of Gang Green? They wearing like their surf shorts and whatnot. This is them. Yeah, so it's they're on stage smashing the keyboard. Right. Um, and then for um, I forget for WBCN, we took them out to uh, the beach in Cape, Cape Cod. Um, those those weird um, colored zinc oxide things we tried to play with and they hated it. So uh -huh. that, so that that's, they're giving the finger with all that, you know, they're like, zinc they're oxide. like you Greco, this is stupid shit. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. right? but, but the thing that's interesting, and we'll see this, we'll talk about this in a minute is that when you got to Hollywood, when you got to LA, your photography became very conceptual and there were a lot of really, really beautiful, clever, wonderful ideas and so you're already thinking about that before you move to L.A., you know, you're thinking, well, what can make a photograph interesting? They're wearing these colorful shorts. Maybe we'll try this colorful zinc colors on their, you know. Oh, I, I would be at news events wishing something would happen. Like you'd be at the most routine press conference and you'd think, you know, wouldn't this make a great spot news picture if someone comes out and punches this guy? And right. you, you, my head was always going like, how, why didn't they put the flag here? And, you know. Right. It's person, like in the, in the second portrait, they, they wiped all the, the colors off, but it's still smeared around. So it's still yeah, and it makes it really interesting. And that's right. that's like the the last light of the day. Right. So. 
So that so so this next shot is um, Al Jurgensen from Ministry. And are so you? I, the, are you I had already LA moved. Show? I had already moved to L.A. Okay. This was a shot for Ray Gun magazine when David Carson was designing Ray Gun. Sure. Um, I had these little gargoyles on my wall and I brought one with me because, I, you know, I was all about the conceptual at that point. Right? right. And and I was doing a lot of stuff in camera in the Hasselblad, like mixing hot light with strobe. So uh, right. a tight hot light where he can move his face around and a tight strobe. And, and that's right. what all of these. And, these and a slow exposure to give you a little bit of blur and movement. Yeah. And whatnot. yeah. And that's for those what, who know, David Carson is this renowned art director. Um, who started at maybe Musician Magazine before Raygun and whatnot. I know he was at Musician Magazine because I did a couple of assignments for him there um, way, way back. And uh, and is this next one, is this also Al Jorgensen? Yeah, so that's Al Jorgensen in his home in Austin. And this is like right when I moved to L.A. So I was doing documentary and journalistic stuff um, uh, for People magazine, but I still had the interest in the conceptual portraiture, and I still, you know, had this love of lighting and and being more creative. So, um, and, and then the next one was the cover, and I had him move his face um, with the strobe on, and then uh, you know, so the strobe freezes one side of his face, right. and the ambient light creates that blur on yeah, the other the side. The blur, yeah. And then a wonderful portrait of Daniel Ash from Love and Rockets. Um, here are some lyrics to a song by The Clash. And um, you, So, I mean, this. a lot of people ask me, you know, why, how I felt music was bad and inauthentic. And they, The Clash has this great song. Um, the Clash has this great song, Hitsville, UK. It's sung by, they, they have female singers singing about it. But, you know, the words go, they stole guitars and used guitars so the tape would understand without even the slightest hope of a thousand sales, a thousand record sales. The band went in and knocked them dead in two minutes, 59. And I know the boy was all alone till the Hitsville hit UK. So it was this time of music when, when punk and new wave proved that they could be big on the radio and, and break apart the traditional record company album oriented rock. So then the next verse is, Mutants, creeps, and muscle men are shaking like a leaf. It blows a hole in the radio where it hasn't sounded good all week. That's how we all felt listening to commercial radio. No consumer trials, which is how they made bands, right? No mm -hmm. AOR in Hitsville, UK. I know the boy felt all alone till the Hitsville hit UK. Right. It's a great song. Yeah, so it really represents that time period and what you guys were all experiencing. So we're going to keep cruising along here and 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 uh, um, pick up the pace just a little bit. Stop me whenever you want to talk about specific things. But Michael's now in Los Angeles, and his lighting style is top top notch. You know, you can always look at a Michael Greco portrait and know that there's a lot of thought behind it and a lot of creativity. And that's what makes Michael a brilliant photographer, right? So here's uh, NWA, Easy e Dr. Dre. Um, this is uh, Jack Lemmon, uh, famous Hollywood. And, you know, again, Michael probably said to Jack Lemmon, put your hands on your face. Oh, I, I had this idea of a hand series and the series didn't come through. This was like the most boring, got paid a fee from uh, his publicity company, PMK or, or Baker, Winoka writer to do a headshot of him for his own personal use. And right. instead I, 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 I took that and tried to make something and you more turned it into an engaging, you know, portrait that is, you know, that, that, that is iconic forever, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm sure our audience is a younger audience for the most part, but this is the guy who did classic movies with Marilyn Monroe, like some like it hot. And he was a very yeah. famous actor at the time. Yeah. And uh, this one of Harmonica Fats, is this like a, a People magazine um, story? No, this was I did a story for what was Buzz magazine at the time. I did a story on the blues clubs that were going out of business in South Central. Got it. And then this shot here is a is, was just, I think, a jewelry ad. But this is your um, homage to like the great lighting people like Harrell. Harrell. Yeah. People like that. You know, I mean, this is just classic 1940s Hollywood. And this is this is also what makes Michael Greco a brilliant photographer is that he could take a picture like this of harmonica fats, which is pretty straightforward, you know, 
you know, simply lit photograph and then come and create this shot for this jewelry company that is just stunning. Yeah, I mean, this was a this was a fashion spread for the L.A. Times Sunday magazine. Okay. So on on New Jewelry, go back, go down to the Singleton picture. Okay. So no, before I go, I just want to say, if you were to take that piece of jewelry off her head, <laughs> you would think this photograph could easily be taken in 1944. You know, it, it, it's it's that look, it's that style. Here's John Singleton. The, the so so guy. this. I, I, the reason I reference it is they're probably out of sequence. I had these Holga cameras. I had always liked um, uh, what's the camera before uh, Diana. The, Holga? the Diana. So I had always liked the Diana, but the Diana couldn't take strobe. Right. right. And I'm Mr. Strobe. I like overpowering the sun and making these really dramatically lit pictures. So the Holga could do that. So I shot Singleton in South Central with a Holga with the flash and the flash would go off twice. So you would have to, I, the, you'd have to tape the whole thing up too, because it light leaked everywhere and right. you would click the button and you would then have to put it against your shirt and release it because it would set the flash off again. Right. But I like, yeah. I, I like the look of the lens. So if you go back up to the jewelry picture, I would put tape around the Hasselblad matte box in the front. Oh, to give that vibe. To give that vibe. And then you go down to the LL Cool J portrait for Vibe magazine. Then, you know, that with him doing his first film and having the, the, the film, the movie film sculpture in the background. But that was done the same way, lit like that, but also taping out the matte box. Right. So, so, so you know what I used to do to create that matte box look? I would shoot, if I was shooting with my 50 millimeter lens, I'd put the lens hood on. Uh, for the 80 and it would do the same thing. Yeah, I, I, we, I eventually did the same thing because it also had the slides, right? You'd slide the slide in the yeah. compendium cha shade. So yeah. we started doing it just with the slides, putting in the wrong slide. Right. And for those of you folks don't know, he mentioned a camera back on the John Singleton photo here, the, a Holga and a Diana. Those were plastic toy cameras that had plastic lenses that we all used for artistic weird ways to come up with we were all trying to break the rules right you know we always like to say understand how to make a photo like the the jewelry photo right you need to understand every rule about photography or lighting camera film exposure um uh, you know history of photography understand all those rules and then come in and do a portrait of of john uh, of, of singleton right and do it with a plastic toy camera breaking all of those rules Right. And that's how we were trying to come up with our own looks and our own styles and our own vibes. I mean, I, I did this portrait shoot with Tom Waits once. And uh, do you remember the action sampler that was also made by them? It was a little 35 millimeter camera that was pink and green plastic and it had four lenses. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The of lens course, spun course. into four. And, the, and, and as Waits is leaving the shoot, I'm like, wait, one more roll. And I'm shooting with this plastic camera that's pink and green with a little plastic viewfinder on the top that you just, you know, it didn't look through the lens. It just looked through a little plastic right, right. square. And I'm like going, and let, you know, and, the, and, and they're just these incredible portraits. And, and usually when the lens spun, one of them would be in focus. One of them was half in focus and the other two were out of focus because the film wouldn't lay flat in the plastic camera, right? So we used to use all these weird, like this Nickelodeon camera I used for a while, like weird, we did weird shit like that all the time. Anyway, we'll keep going here. Um, uh, Dead, can, uh, Dead Can Dance for Rolling Stone. Right, love that portrait. Again, you know, beautiful lighting and, and, and dramatic. Yeah, a hot light and two strobes way up high above them, so. Right, right. And then uh, this is the guy from Southwest Airlines. Um, yeah, Herb Kelleher for, so Business Week, dug all this stuff I was doing at the time and then sent my assistant and I around the world, not really, England and around the U S to do all of these entrepreneurs and, and uh, CEOs. And so you conceptual portraits of these guys. Yeah. Um, Johnny cash, just what a beautiful photograph, you know, Thank you. legendary, you know, incredible Johnny Depp early in his career. Again, you know, these photos are so important historically because here's Johnny Depp, probably he's 20 something years old. And, uh, you know, here we are 30 years later, probably. And, you know, he's this renowned actor and here's this, you know, it's not just a pedestrian, like you didn't say, well, who is this guy? He's made a television show or he's made one, like you knew how important it was to do a beautiful portrait of somebody like Johnny Depp, uh, Johnny Depp on the pool table, Quentin Tarantino, another beautiful thing with this 
coil and this electric thing. Um, yeah, what was your the idea, idea was, was the the idea was the high voltage director. So that's like a prop right out of Frankenstein. I went to a prop sh- place and mm-hmm. yeah, but the story because we're always tied to the story as even on the magazine world uh, as you know journalists of some sort. So his favorite food was Captain Crunch. So we built that scenario uh, with the diner sign and the Captain Crunch and all of that um, and built that in the back of a restaurant that had a trailer and a cantina. So, mm-hmm. yeah, amazing. Amazing. And and again, you know, here you are, you're working in color, you're working in black and white. You know, this is pre-digital, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you would shoot as many different film stocks as you could, right? right? Just to I mean, see back what... then, yeah, that's how we created our look and feel. We shoot black and white, we shoot color, we shoot fast speed film, slow speed film, grainy film, long lenses, short lenses. We would try, you know, 20 different things in a in a half an hour photo shoot. Um, uh, no doubt Gwen Stefani uh, early on for Sassy magazine. You know, these kids are babies here. Um, Terry their Hatcher. First, their first tour. So how do you convince a beautiful actress like Terry Hatcher to take her clothes off and put a rope around her? Well, you, you know, it, it, this was the cover of Movie Line magazine. She had just finished uh, um, su- the Superman series. She was just about to do that movie, Three Days in the Valley or whatever it was called. Mm-hmm. And um, I had this concept. I was going to write. This is the roof of Main, Main Street Studios at the time where I blackened. I, I took a black and I put it behind the air conditioning unit so you couldn't see through it. I wanted it to look like she was trapped in a basement. And I wanted to write. In, so this is all lighting. It's got that's a silk above us. I've got 12 by blacks on the side and a 12 by black behind me. Um, we created that darkness and then I lit it. There's a spotlight on her. There's a strip strobe on her and then blue light going up around the metal and I wanted to write help Superman on the wall and I tell her my idea and she says well I'm off the show I hate Dean Kane, and I'm on to my movie career so you can't write help Superman but I will take off my clothes and you can tie me up <laughs> brilliant love it I mean this is and 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 when I first saw this photograph I just assumed it was indoors, either a set or a basement or something. So knowing that this is outdoors during the middle of the day even makes it more brilliant. You know, all those 12 by 12 blacks you were saying just closes, you know, reverse fill, just blocks everything out. And then you come in and do your beautiful studio lighting. Her Um, husband, her husband opened up the back curtain and I looked at him like, you know, it's an intimate moment. And I'm thinking, who's this? And she goes, oh, hi, John, honey. Hi. You know, because the rope would come off her boobs and she I had her, you know, she's like, oh, that's my husband, John. It's like, oh, hi, John. (laughs) <laughs> Will Smith, beautiful portrait. Um, Selma, uh, Selma Hayek. Selma Hayek, Hayek yeah. Thank you. Uh, William Macy, beautiful conceptual portrait. Is this a location or did you build that background? Well, he he was on the show with um, uh, what's uh, who was the 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 that movie with Tom Cruise? Um, oh, the There's very hot. <laughs> what's that? I said there's been a lot of movies with Tom. No, Cruise. the, the uh, Risky Business, um, oh, okay, Rebecca it. de Mornay. Oh, OK. And, and he looked at me and said, so I did a lot of portraits of him, but he looked at me and said, we're going to be here for four hours for her to do her hair and makeup. I'm like, no. He's like, yeah, let's go get some beers. He, we got a six pack. And I'm just he just let me shoot him all over the place. And I shot him for a couple of hours while we were wearing waiting for her to do her hair. And, makeup. and the portrait was actually the, the assignment was for the two of them. But you did a bunch of stuff of him. Yeah. Yeah. Which, of course, and you know, he's one of our favorite actors. Love this portrait of Robert Duvall with the cross. What was the movie for this? Or uh, the Apostle. He won an Academy Award. So uh, this was for Time magazine. And I again, I wanted to be conceptual. You know, it's like right. he looked at the Polaroid. He's like, looks like a looks like a telephone pole. So we twisted it's a piece of cardboard with a Fresnel light. So uh-huh. we twisted it so it looked like a cross. He's like, all right, that's good. <laughs> uh-huh. A Fresnel hot light or a Fresnel strobe? strobes i had a i had a solar spot uh 2k converted twice because it didn't work well the first time with a dynamite head inside of it right chris farley out at the beach amazing yeah. i don't shoot um ambient a lot but this was for bikini magazine and it was just it i think worked. i shot it with the holga it was just too good to not you right. know to shoot and it became the cover of entertainment weekly when he passed. Oh, nice. The black and white shot, this particular one. Yep. 
and oh, wow. and uh, you know it's it's been it's been nice for me to to which is amazing <clears throat> just to go back a second the cover of entertainment weekly magazine of a photograph taken with a toy camera yeah and and this might have been Hasselblad I'm not sure right. but at the same time I've had a couple of pictures that became sort of Posthumous, posthumously or the 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 image that people are remembered by when they did the documentary they use this image for mel brooks when they did the series on pbs they used my image for the key art so it's nice that historically out of all of the images that they could use to tell someone's stories to have those to right. have the key art in those right beautiful portraits of lucy Liu, just absolutely stunning uh serena williams um young 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 matthew right yeah yeah early is this a people magazine shoot i think it was uh i forget maxim or something one of the celebrity interviews uh it was funny this is when he was out in his backyard naked like ha singing and he was in the press for having done something inappropriate and then you know i got him the next day it was right you know Right. So t talk to me about this Mel Brooks portrait. Like, <clears throat> so, I mean, this is something that we've all seen in different magazines over the time. These 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 trick photos. I mean, obviously, you it, it's it's turned and you have a prop department building the desk that's really on the wall and whatnot. I mean, how long does it take you to build a set like this? So Maddie Miller from People magazine called me up. She said, I stopped working for People Magazine for a while, and then I started working for People Magazine when they did all the special issues, like mm -hmm. the 25 most interesting, the 50 most beautiful, and did those when they had budgets and those conceptual shots. So she loved that movie Royal Wedding with Fred Astaire, where the room uh -huh. turns. And I said, I uh -huh. know how that was done. I went to film school, you know. So <clears throat> we, this is a room on its side. And I uh -huh. actually wanted Mel to be like little serious with a cane and a and his top hat, he couldn't do it. He was just a total jokester the whole time. But right. we built the room and I lit the room then to look like the light was coming in from the window on the side and the light was coming in from above. Like I lit it in a manner that it would it would work in reality. Right. So and they were all big soft boxes with grid spots in them. So the light pooled up, right? right. So that light cutting on the background was looked like it would be from a window coming in, not hitting the ceiling, things like that. Right. Right. And the chair and the desk are of course screwed. Yeah, they're screwed to the to the other side of the wall, you know. So yeah. right. Amazing. Uh a young Larry Page and 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 Sergey from Google. Um I photographed these guys for Fortune magazine when there were 80 employees at Google. And we photographed them in front of the company car, which was a blue v Volkswagen Beetle, right? Sitting on these, these giant rubber balls that were blue. <sighs> now they have, of course, the Google 737 and blah, blah, blah. But at the time, there were 80 employees at Google. Nobody ever heard of them before. Well, right? I did them for a, the cover of Time magazine at that time also. Yeah, and, mine, and was then... in, mine was in 96. Was this about the same time? Um, maybe 98 was the first shoot, right? You know, and then, um, and then shot them for two wired magazine covers after that. Right. Right. I shot Sergey also for wired ones by himself. I did, um, the, the Yahoo guys, um, Philo and Yang for Rolling Stone magazine in 95, there were 15 employees at Yahoo. They wow. had three computers. That was their whole backend server room. Um, shot it all black and white available light. It was just like, you know. Uh, Dan Winters did the formal portrait of the two of them, and I did all the pickup shots. Uh, Spielberg, just beautiful, beautiful, incredible human being and a beautiful, elegant portrait. Um, yeah, is, this was is, done. I mean, for me, it's, it was very important. I convinced them, uh, Michelle Stevenson and um, uh, Arthur, the, the creative director, to do it in camera. I didn't want him stripping stuff out. So that's a we, that was that's a door trans that we had to make around Thanksgiving when everything was closed. That's a huge door trans that I lit from behind. Got it. Got it. So you and that's uh, 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 what film is that from? This is the uh, uh, Munich. <clears throat> Thank you. The, I was going to say the hostage film. I yeah, Munich. Think. That's right. Yeah. So. And of course, this is how it ended up on the cover of Time magazine, which is just amazing. Amazing. And you're right. It would have looked terrible if they had stripped out the around the hair and whatnot and and put it in. Yep. Um, uh, this is, this is a, a film. Do you want to, we're going to show this. You're not going to hear any audio, 
Um, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to play this one and maybe I'll skip the other one. Or do you want me to play the, uh, let's see, is this one the Scorsese one? Play, play this one. Yeah, this is the Scorsese one. So let's do this real quick. I can talk over it, yeah? Yeah, you can talk over it. So there's All right, no so I had a photograph of Martin Scorsese for DirecTV for their magazine, and they did a commercial ad, and Scorsese was, you guys can run it. Uh, Scorsese, Scorsese was writing a review a month for their magazine for their movies on pay-per-view. And this is just a behind the scenes look of how you set up your, your thing on the rooftop. You bring Scorsese in. And then, of course, you end up with this, you know, incredible. Oops, sorry. Come on. Yeah, well, the idea was that Scorsese was like so intrinsically tied to New York. And I want her to shoot him on a new rooftop like Batman looking out over the city. And the best we can get was this uh, deck. So I built that stage of Apple boxes, which, of course, are used in the movies also to get him up higher. So the railing didn't didn't obscure the whole view. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting out of this screen. I don't know what I did and I can't it won't let me out. Um, what is going on? It won't let me do this. Are you still seeing it full screen, Michael, or no? I, I'm not saying I don't get the video feed. All oh, right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Got it. Okay. I don't know why that was being so weird. Uh, and then Terry. of course, and then here's that portrait from behind, which is just, I mean, it looks like it's a movie set. It doesn't look like you're on the rooftop of a of a of a building. Um, let's keep going here. Um, this is after Scorsese. Ter Terry Nunn from oh, Berlin. Oh, right, Terry Nunn, got it. Okay, so uh, from Berlin. So this is back to a little bit of music. Very dramatic, very beautiful, classic, you know, hard shadow, um, hard Yeah, light. that's my Fresnel. Yeah, I was going to say that's got to be your Fresnel light. Just a very, that's a light that shoots through like a glass, uh, old school glass, piece of glass. Lens, like old, yeah. Lens, old movie lights so you can move the lens and whatnot. Um, uh, another beautiful portrait. Um, what was the film for this? Uh, I, I, I don't remember. This was for time also. Al this is Alvador, probably... Right? Yeah. yeah, it's Pedro Amandovar and Penelope Cruz. And the, the whole story talked about their intimacy, that they're they're like lovers. He's gay. They're actually not lovers, of course, but um, their intimacy, that they've been friends and that it was sort of this idea that some of the things she's done with Tom Cruise and do doesn't really show her amazing acting ability, but he brings out the best in her. So. Right. And uh, this is a cover of a book Michael did a few years ago called Naked Ambition. Uh an R-rated look at the uh, X-rated industry. And it's really beautiful portraits all done at the, uh, what's the convention in Vegas? The, the AVN yeah, Awards adult, and adult, Expo. Yeah. Right, Adult Video uh, uh, Music, uh, that Adult Video Awards, um, Adult Video Network, right? AVN, is that what that's AVN, uh, Adult Video News. News, yeah. Just beautiful portraits of people in this industry. And they're like this, so they're not, it's not pornography, but they are photographs of people in the porn industry. Um, another beautiful portrait. Was this an ad campaign? Yeah, this was a campaign for one of the camera manufacturers. And we took, it was all about, uh, it was for Hasselblad. It was all about the otherworldliness, you know, that the camera was the first camera in space and things like that. So right. um, I took her out to Death Valley and everything was all about like space. And, and this is Hasselblad Digital, correct? Um, yes. still still? No, yeah. No, no, that's that's right. It was the it was a while. Ago. It was ten years ago, but that's correct. Yeah, and uh, fastest man in the world. Yeah, uh, Tim Montgomery for Wired magazine. Right. I'm going to go quick here because we got about 15 minutes. We want to leave some time for some questions. Okay. Steve <clears throat> Martin, Kanye, um, Chelsea, Chelsea Handler. Chelsea Handler again. Great concept. Michael coming up with really great ideas. Um, this is. Is this a stuntman that's just this is out? a this is a series of portraits uh, for a um, ad campaign for Procter and Gamble in men's health. And uh, this is sort of a, a homage to Bob Richardson, very famous fashion photographer from the 60s, right? Correct. Terry okay. Richardson's father. He was schizophrenic. He had an amazing career until he started losing it. But um and don't, um, don't none of his ex photographs really exist, like all his negatives. And <clears throat> no, Terry saved them. And he's got a couple. He's got a beautiful book with a picture like this on the cover. And the idea of this was this was done for a cannabis magazine. Right. So that's why <clears throat> that's why, why the homage was appropriate. 
Right. Beautiful. Love this shot. Just beautiful lighting. And is this is this all natural? Uh, available? No, there's a stri- there's a f- I mean, this is <clears throat> this is the thing for me about blending light appropriately. Right. This is in my old house, Black Bottom Pool. It was a cover to um, one of the uh, high end travel magazines. And it's Kelly, who the actress. Um, and there's a little like spotted strobe just bringing up her face, but it's balanced. Right. You wouldn't know. Right. Yeah, which is great, which is an art in itself. Um, this is some stuff you did for Porsche. For Porsche, a fashion shoot for Porsche. Um, you know, obviously the backlight and the lighting is what turns me on here. Yeah, and then this is all done in camera, right? We, uh, do you have like a, what do you got, a hose going up on this woman? Yeah, I had brought, this was a, an ad campaign for a uh, Kate Somerville spas and their products that was called Liquid Lift. And uh, <clears throat> I had two special effects artists with hoses. I heated up that black pot and pool of mine. So I had two special effects artists with hoses. I had a silk over her to keep the light from uh, the sunlight from ruining anything, but giving us a fill above. I had a light skipping off the background (coughs) on the water, and then I had a strobe on her face. Right. Um, This is uh, a cover for Forbes. Forbes. Patrick Dempsey, right. Patrick Dempsey. Yeah, and and a light on a stick. He's walking, we're punching his face in, you know, a light on a stick. Uh, This is with him and his car collection. Right. Another another Forbes cover. Just beautiful, beautiful <clears throat> studio lighting. Yeah, we uh, did this at the Snapchat studios, Snapchat offices. And the whole idea was to have it be impromptu because Snapchat is so, you know, right. instant and mercurial, you know. Right. Right. Another shot, candid shot from that shoot. Uh, Will Farrell, who's just, I mean, just unbelievable. I can't even imagine. Let's, you know, with the film short enough, here's another film that Michael did uh, behind the scenes of the Will Farrell shoot. It's only a minute long, so we can watch this real quick and then we'll go. Right yeah, and, and this is this is for Time. This is an inside cover of Time magazine. Um, it's when he did Blades of Glory. So I've we had like the outfit made and I had uh, the skates brought in, um, but it's in a room at like the four seasons, like we have to take all the furniture out. We convert these rooms into little studios. And for the situation on white, I had this idea because one of the characters is on that polar bear rug. I came up with this concept of white on white. Like I would do a white on white. I dress them in white. I'd use a ring light to fill it. And it would, like the Terry Hatcher thing, um, you know, getting her to take her clothes off and wrap her up in rope. You you do that in advance. But something like this where with Will Farrell, do you say, hey, we're going to put you all in white and have you laying on a bear rug? Do you have to run that by his publicist in advance or is that? No, nah, like- nah. it, it was it was we had 45 minutes because it was Time magazine. But this is in one of those publicity days that right. they're doing two days of publicity at a hotel. Right. So <clears throat> this was like. And he was cool. He knew how to play it. You can see from the shot with the with the ice skate, he knew how to play with it. And the, right. the other shot, you know, all of those are stills from him posing. So, yeah, yeah. amazing. And then this is Amber Rose. Uh, and... Amber Amber Rose for Inked Magazine. Right. And then this one here. Who's this? The, the woman with the bikini top and the Danica the... McKellar, Little Winnie Cooper from the Wonder Years. Oh, my God. Wow. And is this at your pool at your house? This is the famous black bottom pool at the at the last Greco estate. Yes, um, and, I used to love shooting there. And, you know, as you can tell from a lot of the shots, I love flair. Right. You know, I love flair. I love using light into the camera. You know, then when we had to do Will Smith for the cover of Sports Illustrated, when he did um, Concussion, that film, uh, you know, I, this whole thing was about him being like saving you know, his character in the film saving all these lives because he he discovered that concussions were killing these football players. So I have sort of this, you know, the godly backlight coming in, his eyes closed in this moment of, you know, of just solitude, right. you Let know. Back, I want to go back to Winnie Cooper for a second. Is this photograph taken during the day? No, just right at the edge of the so, so, so with a fast enough shutter speed, you can make everything go black. Correct. You've got a strobe in the background to give you your lens flare a little bit and kind of blow it out. 
Um, and then your beautiful studio lighting in front. And then of course, Will, you have some sort of light coming from behind that's hitting your lens, which is creating that lens flare. And you're saying that is intentional, correct? Totally intentional. There's a strobe. If you look at the, in the upper left-hand corner yeah. of the picture, that bluish thing, that's actually a strobe head there blowing yeah. out blowing out and diffracting the, the lens. Right. right. And uh, that brings us to the end of our presentation with Michael Greco. Um, this slide here is my promo slide for my next one in two weeks with Godless. But Michael, just amazing, brilliant body of work. And it's just so nice to see a, this kind of 50 year arc, 40 year arc, whatever it is. Um, so incredible. I mean, thank just, you, Jay, what, so what, much. What a, what a career, what an archive. Um, you should be proud of yourself. You've done well. Um, you Thank know. you. That's really, really nice to hear. I really appreciate it. And um, I appreciate the audience hanging out. So Yeah. Uh, Harrison, do we have any questions for Michael? Yeah, definitely. We've got a few questions ready. Okay. The first one comes from somebody named Nate. And Nate asks, how did you overcome the challenges such as overpowering crowds at punk shows and still capture some incredible photos? Well, the, those crazy nights with Jello and the cramps, I'm at the side of the stage. Like, you know, I have a backstage pass. I have all access. I always go in, you know, doing these shoots are all about preparation. So if it's a big Hollywood shoot, I'm sitting with talent in hair and makeup and I'm getting to know them. Same thing with the punk show. It's like, <clears throat> I'll meet the manager. I've maybe been with the band during the day. I've taken them out to take a picture. They know who I am. Everyone's comfortable with me. And I'm right on the side of the stage. It's like, of, you don't want to spend your time fighting that. You want to photograph it. So. All right, Harrison. Great. Our uh, next question is from Emma. And Emma asks, with the rising popularity of Polaroids and instant film in recent years, have you revisited this format? Not really. Um, the, the reality is you, I want to be left with something that I can scan and have a high res file of. And the Polaroids now, I mean, the Fuji ones like are this big, right? They're really not something. I mean, I have one on my desk of my friends, Dini and Wendell from human sexual response. When I was, you know, at their house in, uh, I forget where this was, uh, Hudson, New York, but it, it's, it, it's, it's not something I use professionally. Yeah. It's just too gimmicky these days. I mean, it's, you know, like my daughter, she's 25 and she wants to bring her little Polaroid out with the, that size film and take pictures of her friends and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely a novel. Here, I've got a question that that came in from from Will, um, uh, and then we'll get back to Harrison. So this is a question for both of us, really. Um, if photography and cameras never existed, where would we be in our life? You know, back in the seventies, what our what would our life have looked like if we didn't? And not if cameras didn't exist, but maybe if we hadn't discovered cameras. Like, where do you think you would have? What do you think you would have gravitated to? I mean, I'm, I'm, my big things are, uh, I love architecture. Um, I studied architecture. You know, I, I took a bunch of uh, uh, fine art classes also in, uh, in college. Uh, I studied with Carl Chiarenza. I studied with, a, a, I forget his name, but a renowned um, art history teacher. And, and I love architecture. I probably would have been an architect. I, right. I love design, right? I love design and the concept of design and the Bauhaus and this idea of less is more, what happens if you drive that down to its basics, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I think for me, um, <clears throat> I'd probably just be a Coke dealer like Michael was and, you know, trying to make, <laughs> trying to make ends meet, you know, doing something like that. But uh, I feel very fortunate that I discovered photography and it's been part of my life for, you know, 45 years now. And, and uh, I've also, been able to have a career and 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 uh, create what I think is a interesting body of work. It's certainly interesting to me, and uh, feel very very fortunate. Um, Harrison, question. Yep, we had uh, we got one more. What was it about the punk and new wave scene that made you want to document it? Well, it. I was all, I was studying photojournalism. So it was like I was being, you know, I was apprenticing with the Associated Press. And it was a scene, the camera does an interesting thing. It 
it, it's like you're able to document something you're interested in and love. You know, I, I explain why I love the music because it was authentic. It was raw. People had something to say that was interesting. It wasn't, you know, a Alice Cooper schools out for the summer, like stupid songs. It was stuff that was challenging. It was stuff when, when you hear a song for the first time, I was still in high school, beat on the brat, beat on the brat, beat on the brat with a baseball bat. Oh yeah. Like it was just, it was jarring. And it was interesting, but the camera gives you entree. Like you have a camera and an assignment and not only do you love this music, but you've just been invited backstage. You've just spent the day with the buzzcocks. So you think you're like off the chart, man. Um, and, and you've just hung out with Pete Shelley and Steve Diggle all day. And then you end up on stage with them shooting video. So it gave you, it gave me access to, to a music I love and, and, yeah, and I wasn't really interested in shooting anything else or doing anything else in, in the music area. I just loved this music and these bands and, you know. No matter no matter what your subject matter is, if you're a professional <clears throat> photographer, the, the, the camera has given us entree to, like Michael says, to so many incredible places and, 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 and experiences that you don't ever, ever have an opportunity to be part of if you're not a photographer, right? You know, whether it's going to Will Smith's house to photograph him for People magazine or backstage with Jerry Garcia doing a portrait for a magazine or, you know, whatever it might be, it's given us this opportunity to have these experiences. And, you know, and I look at a lot of these, you know, I don't do Hollywood actors. I do musicians. Michael has done both um, throughout his whole career. Um, you know, certainly with musicians and certainly with people like Will Farrell and, and, and you know these people are brilliant right and to be around that type of energy and to have those experiences with them inspires us as artists inspires us as photographers so um do you still go see live music Michael do you ever when I mean obviously now nobody's seeing live music but do you still not, not, a, not a lot you know when I moved out here I I chose the life of kids and family and <clears throat> but I'm hoping to get out to Coachella when things uh, uh, go back. And I, I used to, not right. as much anymore. So um, you've left your non your non commercial punk roots to stay away from commercial. And you're going to go to the most commercial music festival in the world. <laughs> well, you, you, yeah, but I, you know, my my <laughs> entertainment uh, attorney probably can get me VIP passes. So. There you go. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, everybody different paths. I stuck with this rock and roll thing. You went Hollywood and you've created this body of work that is just absolutely brilliant. So, Thank you so much. everybody, uh, Harrison, is that it? Or there, is there another question? Or are we, are we done? Um, we can do one more. If uh, All right, let's do one sure, more and we'll then. wrap it up. Last question. Our last question comes from Kevin and Kevin asks, how have you dealt with any creative blocks that you may have had in the past? Um, well, you, you get there and you have to perform. <laughs> so you don't have any choice. So look at the creative process is problem solving. That's really what it is. And it shouldn't be problem solving with anxiety. It shouldn't, you shouldn't look at it as a problem. Problem solving is not a problem. Problem solving is a bunch of decisions that you make. How am I going to light it? What are they going to wear? Where am I going to put them? And, and it's problem solving. And it's just a series of problem solving. And the more you do it, the more you develop your style. You, you tend to solve problems in the same way that give your pictures a look. And you're, so when you're, you know, it's not as if I'm a fine artist looking and shooting leaves and wondering what leaf I'm going to shoot next. It's man, it's man. I'm in a situation. I get talent in a, in an hour. I have to figure out where I'm going to put them, what I'm going to do. You know, I, I've read the story ahead of time and I've figured things out and I'm, you got to perform. It's really that simple. The other thing is you have to remember is that, you know, you look at Michael's body of work and, and the reason why he's able to shoot Steven Spielberg and Steve Martin and Will Smith and, Jack Lemon and get these jobs is because he's able to deliver, right? So his his art directors and photo editors that hire him or hire me, they expect you to be brilliant, okay, every time. Now we can't be brilliant every time, but we hope that we can be really good almost always. And that's why they come back over and over again to hire Michael Greco because he's able to deliver the goods. He's able to solve the problem, right? He's thought about it. Like you said, he's read the article, he has the background. He knows the history of that, that actor, the film they just made, you know, some cultural reference, you know, like with, with Spielberg and the still from Munich, like he knows how to put those cultural references together 
to come out with something that's going to be engaging for the audience that's going to look at it in the magazine or the ad campaign or whatever it is. And those art directors and photo editors that are hiring them say, this really works for us really well. We're going to use Michael again. And that's how the minute you fail at that, the minute you have that anxiety that he mentioned and can't think on the spot or can't come up with a good idea in advance or solve those problems is the minute that that art director, why would they call you again when there's really another 20, 30, 50, 80, 100 photographers that can do a really great portrait? If you can't deliver the goods, they're not going to come back to you again. Yes. And, and the thing is, you're always judged on your last assignment, right? You're always judged, as Jay says, on your last assignment. But you, you also have to have, just have a level of high consistency. Maybe everything's not like a portfolio picture, but you always have to deliver a high consistency and usually shoot within your style because people are want to get something that they've hired you for. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody, that is Photos with Stories with Michael Greco. Thank you all so much. Uh, please remember to go out and check out his book, um, available in fine bookstores everywhere. Um, this is it, Punk, Post-Punk New Wave by Michael Greco. Uh, two weeks, we'll be back with Godless and talking about his street photography from 1974 to 1984. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jay. Really appreciate your time. I want to uh, thank our audience for hanging out for the past two hours. Really appreciate it from everyone. All right. Have a good Sunday. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day.